everybody. We're ready to start. I hope you enjoyed that lunch. Um, I don't know about the regular lunch, but the desserts were fantastic. <clears throat> so we all know that tobacco is bad for us, but we're about to get more detail about just how bad it actually is, not only for individuals, but globally. And to talk to us about that, we have Dr. Judith Mackay. She's a senior advisor to the World Lung Foundation, uh, part of the Bloomberg Initiative to reduce tobacco use. She's a medical doctor who has focused since 1984 on public health, especially tobacco control in low and middle income countries and tobacco and women. I hope someone asks her some questions about tobacco and women. In addition to the Lung Foundation position, she's an advisor to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. She's director of the Asian Consultancy on Tobacco Control and senior policy advisor to WHO. Widely published, she's authored or co-authored several atlases. You can see the list in her full bio. And as a note, let me say I encourage you to read the full bios from all of our speakers. I'm uh, dramatically condensing many of them and condensing all of them at least a little bit. So there's a lot more information about the speakers. I think she is the right person to talk to us about just how bad tobacco is. I'm sure she considers it a point of pride to have been named by the tobacco industry as one of the three most dangerous people in the world. Dr. Mackay. Thank you very much indeed for that kind introduction. And just to mention, I have lived in Asia, in Hong Kong, um, for almost 50 years now, so Hong Kong is very much my home. And I left clinical medicine because, in fact, of the harm of smoking. I came to realize that hospital medicine was like an end stage. We were meeting people with uh, chronic obstructive airways disease, lung cancer, heart disease, at a stage where many of them were beyond repair. So I moved in 1984 into preventive medicine, feeling it was basically the only way to improve um, community health. I've been asked to speak about the harm of tobacco, and I have to say it's about 30 years since I last spoke about the harm of tobacco, because everybody accepts it now. I mean, maybe 30, 40 years ago, it was controversial, does it cause heart disease? Is environmental tobacco smoke harmful? There were many questions raised, particularly from the tobacco industry behind the scenes, challenging the data. But the truth is, we've got thousands of studies now. Everybody accepts that smoking is harmful. They may not know quite how harmful. So forgive me if I stray into policy, which is really my area, is actually policy and advocacy and political lobbying. Um, I cannot speak about environmental tobacco smoke without talking about the need for smoke-free areas. But anyhow, here we go. And it's been interesting to me to put the data together for this particular talk. So we'll cover the history of the knowledge of the harm, um, the types of tobacco and the harmful ingredients, deaths caused by smoking, the harm, looking at e-cigarettes, that's a really red-hot topic at the moment, looking at second-hand smoke and third-hand smoke. How many of you have actually heard of third-hand smoke? Right, yes, it's, it's relatively new, but actually quite important. Smokeless tobacco, looking at health professionals, the harm to youth, and then looking at interventions at the end. So forgive me if I stray into interventions. So when we look at the history of the knowledge, we can go back hundreds of years to England's James I, and he said it was a custom loathsome to the eye, harmful to the nose, harmful to the brain, and dangerous to the lungs. So King James I certainly knew something about tobacco, that it took about 300 years to really start working out the exact details. The modern evidence really started in the 60s. It started with a report in England of the College of Physicians, and then in America in 1964, uh, the Surgeon General released a report on the harm of smoking. And then in terms of secondhand smoke, it was in Japan. Professor Hirayama looked at um, something like 91,000 wives of smokers and realized that in fact, non-smoking wives of smokers were developing lung cancer. So he was the late uh, uh, Takeshi Hirayama, was the person who put that on the agenda. So that's very briefly some of the background. And if we think it's taking us a long time to do anything about smoking, we have to remember that in all public health, it takes about 100 years from identifying a problem to actually solving a problem. This, for example, was true of smallpox. 
And even some of the others, like TB and malaria, we have identified them for about 100 years. We still have not eradicated them. So it may be not so surprising that we still have not eradicated tobacco. We're taking quite a long time to do it. And there's other reasons as well. Um, I'll draw a lot of pictures from the Tobacco Atlas, of which I'm the co-author of the last five editions. And all of you, when you get your registration bag at the conference, I think it's actually in the bag, or there's a slip to get it. You'll all get a free copy of the fifth edition of the Tobacco Atlas, which is being launched at this conference um, in English and Arabic. And then it's being followed in Chinese and uh, French or Spanish later on. So we know there's many, many different kinds of tobacco. And the takeaway message from this slide is that there is no safe tobacco use. Whether you smoke it, you use it in a pipe, you have a cigar, whether you chew it, you sniff it, you inhale it through water, every single method of smoking is actually dangerous. Um, slightly different degrees of danger, but actually not that much. So however you use tobacco, it's going to be harmful to you. There's no safe way of using it. And if we look at some of the chemicals that are in tobacco smoke, it's not surprising. There's all sorts of things like cadmium that's in batteries. Um, there's um, uh, radioactive polonium. Um, it, which causes, of course, the lung cancer. There's acetic acid, there's nicotine, there's carbon monoxide. You name it, there are thousands of chemicals in cigarettes that actually cause harm. And there's about eight different ones that cause the lung cancer, which is perhaps the best well-known, but many, many other chemicals as well that really are basically causing cancer. And so the Food and Drug Administration in the US has said there's no tobacco product have been scientifically proven to reduce the risk of tobacco disease, improve safety, or cause less harm. So as I said, this is the takeaway message. All tobacco use is dangerous. So let's look first of all at the number of deaths. Many people think in many countries, particularly in the West, and in Europe and in Australia. Okay, we're on top of this epidemic. Our smoking rates are coming down. People know about smoking. We're sort of a bit ahead of the game. But actually, this epidemic is increasing, and it will increase for at least the next 20 to 30 years. The reason is there are more, going to be more people in the world. We've got about 7 billion today. We'll have 9 billion by 2040. So even if we bring the prevalence rate, the percentage rate of smokers down, it will be offset by this huge population growth. In other words, though, and people of course are living longer, so in, by 2030, 2040, there'll be more smokers, there'll be more cigarettes, there'll be higher consumption, there'll be more disease and deaths with a huge impact on healthcare facilities. There'll be more jobs for farmers and manufacturers. There'll be more tax for governments, and there'll be more profits from the tobacco industry for at least the next 20, 30, even 40 years to come. Because as I said, even if you reduce the percentage of smokers, there's simply more people in the world. It's as simple as that. So when the tobacco industry say, oh, well, what about the tobacco farmers? They are laughing all the way to the bank, the tobacco industry. They're going to be making profits for a great many years to come. Here we see it graphically. These are the population pyramids that you can see very clearly. These were in 2010, if I can get this, 2010. This sort of bulge at the bottom, but it's moving through and people are surviving. So we're going to have more smokers. So, even if that smoking prevalence comes down, we're going to have more smokers, 1.4 billion today, 1.6 billion by 2030. Tobacco consumption is continuing to rise, and the annual deaths will go from about six to somewhere between eight to 10 million. This epidemic is on the increase, not the decrease in terms of its impact. So here we go. This is another, just another slide to show the same thing. This is from an earlier tobacco atlas. 2015, 5 million deaths, way up um, to a much higher number in the future. And the other thing to remember about smoking is that we have no other consumer product on the market that causes this degree of harm. Um, smoking here, it's more than one in two smokers. It's 
probably closer to two out of every three smokers die from it. The more evidence we're getting, the more harmful we realize it is, particularly if people start smoking in their teens. So this is just a very graphic picture to show that one in two smokers will die and half of them will die in middle age. So if you have two friends, both smokers, one of them will go to the other one's funeral. Um, you know, we need messages like that to try and get across the impact of just how very dangerous this is. Um, female smoking prevalence and deaths, we can see in the whole epidemic, there's a stage one, there's a stage two, there's a stage three, and finally the epidemic begins to turn um, in the uh, stage four. And there's curves like this to show how in low and middle income countries now, most low and middle income countries are at the stage of a high percentage of male smokers. In Asia, where I live, um, about 50% of men smoke and about 5% of women in Asia. And one of our biggest challenges in public health is to try and stop those females starting to smoke. If we have one thing to do in the world in preventing public health problems, it's preventing Asian women from starting smoking. The tobacco industry are very interested in Asian women and they are targeting them and trying to recruit them. But it's probably the big, biggest single public health true preventive act we can ever accomplish is to prevent women from smoking in the low and middle income countries. So here's the picture of male deaths and you can see that Russia, Eastern Europe absolutely top the list here. Um, it's the number one killer in China as well. Um, but less so, it's decreasing in some parts of the world. And it hasn't even really cr increased that much in places like Africa because economically, the Africans are not able to buy as many cigarettes and smoke 20 or 30 a day. So it's low in Africa, not because of good prevention. It's just because they haven't really got the affluence to start smoking. So those are the male deaths. And if we keep the same key and look at the female deaths, you'll see the pattern is completely different. It's much more in Europe and in North America. The darker colors are where there is the highest rates of, of female deaths. So the whole world is sort of more or less divided into the Western countries where many male and female rates are the same, and the low and middle income countries, a high prevalence of male smoking, and Africa, where they haven't really started yet. Um, if we look at the number of projected tobacco deaths, we can see that the main causes of these deaths, a third of them are caused by cancer, about a third of them are caused by respiratory disease, that's chronic obstructive airways disease, emphysema and bronchitis, and about a third of them are caused by heart disease. Now there's a few others, digestive diseases, diabetes, um, pneumonia, tuberculosis, but it isn't like a car crash, it isn't like a terrorist attack, it isn't like SARS even, or MERS in the Middle East, it's not like any of these much more dramatic epidemics that get the front page of the newspapers, or even suicides, and yet it's killing far more people. But most people, unless they ha are caught in a fire caused by smoking, most people, and then that's often not reported that it was a, a cigarette that started it, um, most of people die fairly quietly. They die at home, they die in hospital, they are unnoticed, all these deaths. So this is why it's quite difficult to get stories that really will focus on the huge catastrophe and the emergency. I mean, people don't think of smoking as an emergency, but it's a much more important health problem. SARS in China, 300 deaths, 300 in Hong Kong. Hong Kong, 300 deaths. We have 6,000 deaths a year from smoking. It's a completely different order of magnitude, and it should be headlines almost every day in the paper. What are governments doing? Why are they not taking action? And yet, really difficult to get that energy and that understanding that we're dealing with a huge, massive international public <coughs> health crisis that really needs addressing. If we look at the harm from smoking, what I've done here is to put together um, a, a, a sort of grid, in a sense, of looking at tobacco use, diets, physical activity, and the harmful use of alcohol. These are the chronic diseases. Cardiovascular, diabetes, cancer, chronic disease. Tobacco is involved with all of them. But one thing you do get from this slide is really how interactive all these processes are. 
If you've got somebody who uses tobacco, has an unhealthy diet, doesn't do any exercise, and drinks a lot of alcohol, they are almost destined to get one of the non-communicable diseases, like cancer and like heart disease. But tobacco use is, is ahead of that list. It's been there the longest. There's been more work done on tobacco than really any of the others. And I think what tobacco has done, it's been the pilot in understanding how political these issues are. Um, the health model is certainly not enough for trying to combat the tobacco epidemic. We have to engage with economists, environmentalists, um, people involved with taxation. We have to understand the vector. We have to understand the tobacco industry and the way it behaves. And whereas at one time we used to think that only the tobacco industry was really dreadful, I think nowadays we're seeing with alcohol and with sugar that some of these other big industries are really almost as bad as the tobacco industry in their denial of the evidence. And they're trying to prevent particularly legislation and taxation. I'm not going to even begin to go through this slide. I'm just going to show you that it's everywhere. Because tobacco smoke, the products get into the bloodstream. They just go everywhere in the body. So you get very, very remote cancers um, and effects, like the kidneys and the bladder, or wounds and surgery. The skin doesn't heal as well. Every single part of the body is actually affected by nicotine and by tobacco smoke. And I think this picture, which is in the atlas, by the way, I think shows this very well. And also one of the real problems in terms of harm is just how addictive tobacco smoke is. Most adults, I, I would go as far as to say I have never met an adult yet in the last 30 years I've been working in this field. I've never met an adult who would, not, who would not prefer not to be a smoker. I think that's the right way around. It's a double negative. They, they know it's harmful. They know it's expensive. They don't want the children to smoke. They'd like to give it up. And yet they're chained. They're locked into a very addictive habit that most of them would prefer to quit. And all it takes, interestingly enough, is about 100 cigarettes. If you smoke a total of 100 cigarettes, which is only, in fact, five packs of cigarettes, only 100 cigarettes and you will become a lifelong smoker. It is as addictive as that. So this is why youth experimentation is really, really dangerous. I'll come back to youth a bit later in the lecture. So this is one of the real problems of tobacco and why people can't just put it, okay, it's harmful, stub it out. They can't do that because they're locked into this addictive process. The tobacco industry have lied and lied and lied about tobacco. That's the only word I can use. And here they are, five executives of the big top five tobacco companies. They are swearing under oath at a congressional hearing, nicotine is not addictive. I do not believe that nicotine is addictive. I do not believe nicotine is addictive, one after the other. And this, in a sense, is in the old days. Because many of the documents of the tobacco industry are now in the public domain, because of a court case in America, we see, we can read, that they do know it's addictive. And they have known it for 40 years, and yet they have denied it and lied to the public. They've lied to their own clients. They've lied to smokers. And they've said, no, it is not addictive. The tobacco industry have, and, and they still do to this day. So heart disease is rather the forgotten illness of tobacco, but in fact, a fifth of all heart disease in the world is caused by smoking. And in fact, more numerically more people die from heart disease from smoking than do from lung cancer, because there's more people who die from heart disease. One of the problems is there's a huge lack of awareness amongst smokers that smoking causes these illnesses. These are in a variety of countries, and I guess um, are, are the slides going to be available to them? They'll be sent to everybody. Great. I mean, it just shows in all of these countries from, you know, Brazil, New Zealand, Thailand, um, Canada, some of the wealthier countries, South Korea, uh, Uruguay, all over the world, there is a lack of awareness that smoking causes heart disease in particular. In fact, only 3% of people in China know that smoking causes heart disease. They know it's bad for you. They know it probably causes cancer and it makes you a bit breathless, but they just don't know that. They don't know it causes stroke. And even in Germany, um, the, there's a lack of awareness as well as China. The 
lung cancer awareness is the highest everywhere, but it's really important that smokers understand it's not just lung cancer that is in fact so dangerous. So about one in five of cancer deaths are caused by tobacco. And here you are, where are they? They're of course mostly in the lung up here, but they're also in the throat, in the esophagus, but down to the bladder, the kidney, the pancreas, causing leukemia, liver cancer, stomach cancer, cervix cancer, many, many, many different cancers. And the biggest impact in the world that we can use to reduce cancer would actually be to encourage people to stop smoking. It would have a bigger impact than almost anything else we can think of doing. We must never forget your teeth. This is an atlas that I did on oral health. Um, and the oral effects of tobacco are oral cancer, um, a sort of smoker's palate with a brown tongue, Periodontal disease around the teeth, premature tooth loss, gingivitis, staining, bad breath, and a loss of taste and smell. So wherever you go in the body, there are really important health implications. And certainly on global health, the effect of tobacco on oral health is substantial. Chronic obstructive airways disease, and you can see at the bottom here a healthy lung. That's what color it looks like. And this is a smoker's lung, it, the heart in the middle. These two lungs look really black and grubby from the accumulation of many, many years. And chronic obstructive airways disease is a pretty horrible thing to have. You just feel you can't breathe all the time. You get progressively short of breath. You can walk shorter distances till really you get to a stage where I couldn't even walk to you. You would be so breathless and need an oxygen cylinder. It's a most horrible disease is chronic obstructive airways disease. And we must never forget in South Asia, what we used to call the Indian subcontinent, a lot of people there use this um, oral chewing tobacco that you see here. Sometimes it's branded in boxes, but it causes the cancers of the lips and the mouth in particular. Um, and a lot of women, in fact, in South Asia use um, oral tobacco products. So let's look about some of the economics of the harm because, you know, my job is interesting in that I work with kings and with communists and with democracies throughout Asia. There's many different forms of government. There's many different stages of development. There's many different sizes of countries from about a thousand people who live in some of the Pacific Islands to 1.3 billion people in China. But the reality is that wherever I work, I find what I do is almost the same. It's the same product, it's the same health effects, it's the same obstacles, and it's the same things that need to be done, no matter what kind of jurisdiction you're working in. So my work, I've worked with kingdoms like Thailand, I've worked with democracies like so-called in the Philippines. Most recently, I've been working in North Korea. I've been there three times now in the last two years working with the government there to reduce tobacco. Um, and the needs and the problems and the questions are just almost identical as to what if I was giving a talk in Indonesia or Germany or what have you. It's so similar what needs to be done. And the biggest obstacles to governments, governments will all say to me, well, yes, yes, we know it's harmful, but, there's the but, but, we're economically dependent on tobacco. Um, we, the farmers, we've got farmers employed by it, we've got manufacturers employed by it, we rely on the tax coming into government for it. They will all say, they will, the, uh, the argument against it, the yes but, is always economic. It's not, well, yes but, you know, uh, it may be not as many as 25% of people get heart disease from smoking. Never challenging the health evidence. What is challenged is the economic consequences for the countries. And that's why you have to marry what you know about health and harm, and that's why we're all in it to save lives. But you have to master the economic elements, the economic arguments, if you're going to make any difference. And I'd like to just go through some of these costs because they are so important in actually reducing the harm. And it may seem strange to you that if we're talking about reducing harm, we're now talking about fiscal policies and economics. But that's what you have to do to get governments to take notice. So governments see the tax coming into them. What they don't see, in fact, is the economic money that is being put out. And there's so much. There's medical and healthcare costs, absence rates, loss of skilled workers by premature death, 
early retirement, the risks of second-hand smoke. There's even the seven minutes that smokers take off to smoke a cigarette. They go outside and smoke a cigarette. That translates into lost productivity. Fires, a third, one in three fires in the world is caused by careless smoking. And that has a huge economic impact. And that's, that's a global average. It's about a third everywhere you look. Damage to building fabric. If I was speaking in a non-smoking area on a screen like this, a cinema screen, you would have to change the screen about every 11 years. If you allow smoking in a cinema and you have one of these screens, you have to change it every two years. There's all sorts of economic costs. And then, of course, you've got the litter, the rubbish um, from uh, cigarettes, all of those thousands of millions of cigarettes that are th discarded every day, the matches, the lighters, the packets, all of that smoking paraphernalia. Somebody has to clean that up. It's got to be either put into a landfill or it's got to be um, recycled in some way. And then increasingly, there is a risk of being sued. In many of the rich countries now, um, employees are taking their employers to court saying that you are not providing a smoke-free workplace. In the workplace, if they work for a big company, in the workplace, by allowing smoking, you are exposing us to cancer substances. You're exposing us to harm. We are working in a harmful environment. And if they get lung cancer or if they get worse asthma, they're suing their employees for not providing a smoke-free workplace. That really hasn't happened in many of the low and middle income countries yet, but it's certainly happening in the more wealthy countries, and it's certainly something that might well come. And this is just a picture in Vietnam I took a few years ago of the main cancer hospital in Vietnam. And the reason I'm showing this is that not just relatives, but patients are having to camp out in the courtyard. This hospital is swamped. It's a cancer hospital. It cannot cope even now. So you can imagine in the future how difficult it will be for a hospital like this to cope with the increased harm from smoking. There are more costs to governments. You're cutting down trees. I mean, if you're interested in the environment as journalists, then there's a huge area of environmental costs from tobacco. Deforestation as you cut down trees uh, to cure tobacco. There's the cost of arable land that could grow food. And in China, this is really, really important. China now cannot feed its people. It's having to import grain from Canada and from other places. And yet it's spending all of this use of arable land growing tobacco. So this is why tobacco is not just an economic issue. It's highly political as well. If you've got a country that can't feed itself and become politically dependent on other countries to provide food, that is hugely political. There's, if foreign cigarettes are imported, then a country will lose foreign exchange. Then, of course, there's a cost of smoke to smokers and their families. And many of these costs, of course, are related to the costs of harm, which is what this lecture is about. Premature death, ill health, health care costs. There's the costs of secondhand smoke on the health of other people in the family, never mind the cost of purchasing cigarettes. And we just worked out that if you live in Georgia or Papua New Guinea or Ghana, uh, you could get a kilogram of fish in Ghana for the amount it costs to buy a packet of cigarettes. And what we are seeing in the low and middle income countries is poverty, poverty exacerbated by purchasing cigarettes rather than purchasing food or shelter or education or even going on a holiday, a family holiday. All of these things in many of the low and middle income countries Smokers are spending up to 50% of their family income on tobacco. So that, again, has a huge impact on the family and, in fact, on the heart. So let's just look at, have a look at e-cigarettes. I tell you, everybody this year is asking me about three things. One of them is e-cigarettes. One is about the referendum in Scotland, because that's where I come from. What did I think about the referendum in Scotland? And the third is, what about the Occupy movement in Hong Kong? So two of them are non, uh, not to do with this lecture, but e-cigarettes certainly is. Everybody says, what do we do about e-cigarettes? E and it's not just you. I don't think a week goes by and a nation government does not contact me and say, what should we do about e-cigarettes? Nobody really quite knows what to do about them. 
Um, this is just a picture of them. But this is an interesting slide because it shows the ha relative harmfulness of e-cigarettes. Here you've got cigarettes. The harmfulness is given a number at 99, a harm score. Um, smokeless tobacco, in fact, is less harmful than smoking. But e-cigarettes is five compared with 99, and the nicotine patches that you put on to quit smoking are even safer, if you could even use that word, safer. So if you just look at the chemicals in e-cigarettes, you can see they are much, much less harmful than cigarettes. So if the entire world was to stop smoking cigarettes, and the entire world was to start using e-cigarettes instead, we would save an awful lot of lives. It's not as simple as that, though, and I'll explain why. I talked to the head of the FDA in the US just a few weeks ago about this, and he said, e-cigarettes have a capacity to do great good, they have a capacity to do great harm, and we simply don't quite know, um, it's not clear which way it will go. Even the health effects, we just don't have enough evidence. We haven't had that hundred or at least a good 50 years of knowing how dangerous cigarettes are. We haven't got that with e-cigarettes. So we still, we can see the ingredients are less, but we really just don't know. Um, and even the ingredients, we actually don't know what's in them. That's part of the problem. Mostly unknown, some are toxic. Some of them have nicotine. Some don't even have nicotine in them. They just have a lot of sort of glycerine type of products in them. Um, in smoke-free areas, we have no idea. For example, if somebody was vaping, as they call it in this room, an e-cigarette, um, how much is going into the environment? We haven't measured that. We don't know how much the effect would be on you people if one person was to be using it. And in terms of smoke-free laws, it makes it really confusing. You are a police person or a tobacco control officer. You go into a restaurant and there's sort of smoke and vapor in the air. It's supposed to be a smoke-free restaurant. Um, do you only take the cigarettes that have got the e-cigarettes with nicotine in them or all e-cigarettes? Should they be banned in smoke-free areas along with other cigarette products? We just don't know. And even in terms of cessation, we don't yet have enough evidence on their effectiveness at all, whether they help people quit or do they in fact help make smokers continue thinking that they're safer. It's a behavioral science that we don't, we don't know with children. Do children start with e-cigarettes? Does it make them dual use, as it's called, smoke and vape? Does it prevent smokers from quitting smoking? The one thing we do know with cessation is that smokers like them better. They, because they look rather sophisticated, because they look rather chic, um, they prefer to have an e-cigarette than rather slap a patch on your hand. They prefer that. And one of the huge problems is that every, every one of the e-cigarette companies except one, and that's Enjoy, every single one of the others has now been bought by the big tobacco companies, by big tobacco. So they are now behind e-cigarettes. And their history is not one that gives me great confidence that they will do the right thing. So we're beginning to see, again, these advertisements disappeared 40, 50 years ago in most places. This kind of glamour, sophistication, um, the sexiness, the better smoking choice, e-lights and so on, the green one in the middle, go outdoors into nice fresh air, uh, looks and tastes like a real cigarette, but I'm out in the green and I'm healthy. All of these images have suddenly come back in the last year or two. We hadn't seen images like this in many places for decades. And the men's are no better. They're all to do with being cool, being smooth, being a bloke. Um, again, lying out in the forest um, and having all the nice trees and things around you. All of these images are now coming back, um, which we thought had gone. So where we're now, the world is at a stage of just beginning to what is called denormalized smoking. In other words, it's not considered an acceptable norm. Um, in uh, most places now in the world, many, many places, restaurants, um, bars, shopping malls, 
um, public transport, it's all been banned, it's becoming denormalized, it's becoming unacceptable, it's becoming a minority habit. And suddenly, we're back to 50 years ago where it is being glamorized and promoted and encouraged, and that's one of the male problems. So what to do about e-cigarettes? So what to do, what to do, says this um, animal here, when and why and who and what and which. So I think it's a very complex problem for us. And w the public health community and the governments, in fact, are now having to act before we have the science. We just don't have enough science to support knowing what to do. There are some things we can all agree on. Every single study now on cigarettes should include e-cigarettes, whether it's a national survey, a subnational survey, global, you name it. Children, we must include e-cigarettes into that survey. The second thing is that we must either insist um, that the ingredients are disclosed or government chemists, where they are them, can analyze them because we just don't know what's in them. And there's hundreds of them now, hundreds of different makes. Thirdly, we can all agree that they should not be sold to children, to young people, any more than ordinary cigarettes should be. Um, so there are some things that I think almost everybody would agree on. The difficult areas are advertising. Should they be banned, like most tobacco advertising? Given that they're safer, should they be banned? And the really difficult one are the smoke-free areas. Should they be banned along with um, smoke-free? Now, Beijing is going to have its national, on the 1st of uh, June, uh, Beijing is going smoke-free with actually one of the best laws in the world. They're not including e-cigarettes. Um, governments just don't quite know how to handle this. It's just such a difficult problem. Excuse me, Judith, could I ask a question? Yes, please do. Where are e-cigarettes available? Like, where do you buy them from? Um, there are many special shops that have just popped up selling nothing but e-cigarettes. Kiosks and shops like that, or vape shops and vape restaurants where you can buy them. But mostly you can buy them in like, um, a sort of convenience stores kind of place. Smoking stores and convenience stores, you can get them pretty easily. Um, in the low and middle income countries, they have not quite got into the system as much as they have, for example, in North America and in many places in Europe, but you can buy them very easily indeed. Okay. Another question on, on that. Yes. Um, if you're, a, you're trying to quit and you're seeing a counsellor or a doctor, yes. would they ever suggest, like, are they able to prescribe e-cigarettes? Or is yeah, that actually something that's banned? It, that's a really interesting question. In some countries, e-cigarettes are only available on prescription, like in Taiwan um, and other places. They have them just on prescription. Um, many, uh, you know, it's really difficult because there's quite a lot of smokers who do find them very helpful in terms of quitting smoking. So this is why, as I say, we just don't have you need population studies to make governments act rather than individual anecdotes. I have to say, if somebody came to me, heavy smoker, saying, I've changed to, e to vaping, to e-cigarettes, I'm off the cigarettes completely, I certainly wouldn't say, well, you know, I think we haven't got the behavioral science in yet. I would, I would say, well, fine, if you can stay just on vaping and then try and get off of that eventually. You know, it's, it's so much safer that this is the dilemma and the difficulty. So I think, as I said, if you have a parent or something like that who are, or a sister or a brother who has managed to get off cigarettes and onto vaping, I, I honestly would just let it, I would leave it in place. Yes. No, that's completely true. That's another really good point. They're not covered by the laws. They are so new. Um, gov some governments, for example, in Hong Kong, we found, somewhat to our surprise, and other countries have done this too, I think Canada, we found that they are covered by an old law, even before e-cigarettes were invented. You know, any product containing nicotine, et cetera, et cetera, you know, uh, it comes under this law. So some countries have found to their surprise, yes, e-cigarettes are covered if they contain nicotine, but we need a whole new set of laws or including them into some of the existing laws. But no, some, the, fr the framing, the naming, the words of some laws do include them. But that was accidental. That was not with any intent. It, I don't know of very many new laws on e-cigarettes that have come in 
in the last couple of years yet because governments haven't had a chance to do it. And the other thing I say to governments, if like in Hong Kong, um, you found you've banned it, I say just leave that in place for two years. In another two years, we should have some better signs. We'll know better what to do. Just leave the ban in place for the moment. But no, they're not covered by advertising bans. They're not covered by smoke-free areas. They're not covered by the age you can sell them to. And this is part of their problem. It's, it's a wild west. It's a free-for-all. They can, people can do anything with them. And you know that urgently needs some kind of legislation and regulation. And I have to say it's divided, the public health community. Um, in general, in North America, they are much more into banning them. I, you know, the, the, um, I was at a meeting recently in New York, a uh, Bloomberg uh, tobacco meeting, a uh, partners meeting, but they invited in an economist from Bloomberg to speak at that meeting. He no, nothing to do with tobacco. He was one of their economists for Bloomberg. Um, for his work with um, you know, the Wall Street Journal and the stock markets. And he said they're less than 1% of the world market at the moment. In 10 years, they will be 10%. So they're going to be increasing a lot. And so we can't wish them away. They're here. We've got to work out how best to regulate them and work together. And the problem is that the movement is very divided. There are those who think they should be banned. There are those who think that we need to en almost encourage them as a safer if I even dare use that word, a safer alternative to cigarettes. So there's two very powerful camps here. And if what one thing I could advise you during this conference, go to the sessions on e-cigarettes. They will be very lively. There'll be a lot of discussion and disagreement. And I'm chairing a plenary for World Health Organization. And they're really worried that somebody might stand up from the audience and disrupt the whole thing by asking a question about e-cigarettes. You know, it's as, it's as strong as that, the, 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 power, the sort of the different warring tribes, actually, the two different sides. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is that some years ago, 20 years ago, the tobacco industry introduced a low-tar cigarette. And we were very attracted to this, harm reduction, much safer. But as time developed, we found it wasn't harm reduction at all. Smokers closed off the holes with their fingers. There were holes in the filter. They closed them off, so they were getting more. They took more puffs on each cigarette. They inhaled more deeply. They smoked much further down the cigarette. So at the end of the day, the amount of harm they were getting was identical to a normal smoker. But the tobacco industry really took a joyride on that. You know, harmless cigarette, much, sa much safer, even safe. Not just safer, but safe. They used that. And that really, I think, influenced a lot of smokers not to try and quit. So that's the dilemma, really. We've been burnt once, if I could. I mean, it's a bit of a pun, that. But I mean, our fingers have been burnt once by the low tar issue. So everybody's very careful about this e-cigarette business. And it's just difficult. I have no easy answer for this at all yet, to tell the truth. Uh, just to f finish my question, yes. um, do you think that the tobacco industry could take advantage of this? You mentioned that they are purchasing, they are buying oh. the e-cigarette companies, oh, but which one. means that they could take advantage of this window. There could be years of scientific more research about e-cigarettes while there are no laws to cover mm -hmm. that, oh, they absolutely. could take advantage and they could add a lot of chemicals to the e-cigarettes too. They do, there are no laws, laws, right? Absolutely. That's why it's even more worrying that it's now the traditional cigarette companies that have bought them all up. Because, as I said, I have zero confidence in their behavior to do the right thing. Absolutely zero confidence. I mean, if they're in the hands of the uh, tobacco companies, then you know that's the worst scenario of all. Uh, it doesn't mean they will behave responsibly in any way, shape, or form. And just look at the advertising that they're doing. They're obviously taking huge advantages of this window, just like you say, huge advantages to actually promote and uh, you know get get back across the idea of the joys of smoking. So. No easy answers on that one. Now I've got stuck. Just a minute. Excuse me. That's, right. that's oh, and this is just while we're asking the question. This is just a map to show the greener, the legal to sell them, 
the yellow or where there are some, I can't quite read it from here, um, some restrictions, um, bans countries where the regulations are not clear. The world's all over the place. And it's probably even changed since this was produced a few months ago. Right, yes, the question. Yeah, actually I would like to know about this map, but you just show it to us. Yes. So I wonder, in this map, you said that Indonesia is one of the countries which is a complete ban on the import of e-cigarettes. But so far I know there is a lot of e-cigarettes in Indonesia. Do you know which uh, organization that has a regulation about managing this e-cigarette? Just because you mentioned that uh, the ingredient of the e-cigarette should be published, should be open to the public. So do you know which uh, organization or institution that has a uh, standardization or doing the research about these easy guards? Now, very few countries outside Europe and North America have done any research on them. I'm pretty sure, I haven't got it 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure Indonesia has not done an analysis of the ingredients. They haven't worked out, do they help quit smokers? This is the, yet the other problem, that the bit of research we have, A, is not very good, and B, most of it comes, in fact, from the US. Um, that's where most of it is done. And, of course, the smoking patterns and way of smoking might be very different in Indonesia um, when you've got, you know, the clove cigarettes and all the others, too. You've got to do research in the context of the whole of the smoking pattern. And we have almost zero research from anywhere else except North America. There's a little bit in the UK, but very little indeed. I don't know exactly what organization in Indonesia is doing them, but governments are tending to pass a law on the basis of just international opinion on them, to tell the truth. Whether they, whether they find there's an old law, whether they try and pass a new law or regulation, they're not doing their own research on this. And I don't think every country has to do its own research. I think we just need more data full stop. And we certainly need more data from the low and middle income countries, of which there's almost none at the moment. It's proving the most interesting bit of the talk to now, just like everybody asks me, what about the Scottish referendum? What about the Occupy movement? What about e-cigarettes? This is obviously <laughs> quite a hot topic. <laughs> right. Yes, hello. Um, I just uh, happened to interview uh, China's uh, State uh, Tobacco Monopoly Bureau, uh, I think last, last month. An official just told me that uh, they're trying to put uh, e-cigarette also under the tobacco control, no, tobacco monopoly po policy in China. So um, uh, the good part is that um, then we can just put e-cigarette uh, into the uh, existing uh, public place tobacco, uh, not tobacco smoking control laws and regulations in China. That means we can now use e-cigarette in public places in China. But the other on the other side, you know, um, the e-cigarette in the future put under the state monopoly system, then they have more, you know, sales outlets and networks to, you know, develop, to become big in China. Right now, though, you know, 80% of the uh, e-cigarettes um, supplied worldwide is actually produced in China, yes. but it's not big business in China nowadays. Right. So um, yes. I'm curious about your comment if China, you know, uh, succeeded to put e-cigarette under the state monopoly policy. So what's her comment on that? What, you know, how that will impact China's tobacco control, you know, the entire landscape? Thank you. Well, there's a few things I'd like to say about that. First of all, the Chinese tobacco monopoly, which is a government department, is actually the biggest tobacco company in the world. It is much bigger than Philip Morris. It is bigger than British American Tobacco. It's bigger than um, R.J. Reynolds, you name it. It's got about a third of the world shares, which of course it sells mostly in China, but it's still a very, very powerful industry. Second, the national monopoly is behaving more and more like the transnational tobacco companies in terms of denying the health evidence, of using economic data to try and obstruct laws going through. And for example, there's two laws in the process of going through in China at the moment, national smoke-free and an advertising law. Um, the national smoke-free is at the moment with the state council. The advertising law will go before the National People's Congress. 
And on both of those laws, the national tobacco industry is fighting tooth and nail against restrictions on them. So to say, you know, to imply it's a rather nice benign force and wouldn't it be better looking after e-cigarettes, I would be really suspicious. It will have to go under the monopoly because it, the, all of, most of them are made in China, as you say. They're going to start being smoked in China and it will almost certainly have to come under the monopoly. But I think we've got to be extremely careful to think that that is somehow going to make it all right. Um, I think that they will probably follow the transnational tobacco industries as they are in many ways, advertising, for example. Um, and all, we've got 44 monopolies still in the world. Many people think that monopolies are a thing of the past. There's 44 monopolies in different countries in the world, state-owned um, tobacco industries. And I think most of them, they're economic. They'll see where their money is going to lie. They'll take on e-cigarettes and try and sell them and promote them in the same way as the transnational companies. And we're finding even Japan is such a good example. Um, its state monopoly is really, I mean, really quite toxic. And it's now behaving just like all of the other transnational tobacco industries, even though it's sort of semi-privatized and so on. I think I'm going to have to move on from e-cigarettes because we're really beginning to run a bit out of time, to tell the truth. I'm only halfway through, and we've spent about half an hour on e-cigarettes, so I can quite see that this is the hot topic. I was just advising Esan that they all go to the e-cigarette talks in the conference. I think there'll be very lively discussions, but I think right now we're going to have to do that. Um, this is uh, looking at second-hand smoke, and again you can see the countries where there's high male smoking rates have got high exposure to second-hand. And we know of the evidence of what second-hand smoke causes in adults, coronary heart disease and lung cancer, and the suggestive evidence for a whole bunch more things. And in children, middle ear disease, respiratory symptoms, impaired lung function, SIDS, the death symptom. And in China, this is a very good argument about parental smoking with the one-child policy that China has had. That child is a very precious child. And if you want that child to grow up, even from a height point of view and an intellectual development and many other things beside, you should, that's a very powerful argument for the press to use in terms of um, decreasing smoking in China. Think about your one child. The distribution of global deaths from secondhand smoke, again predominantly in Russia and in Asia, less so in other countries, um, only 5.6% in the Americas. And here again, just numbers of the global deaths. You're going to get these slides, so I think I'm going to have to just romp through this section a bit more. But except to say that there's an astonishing lack of awareness around the world that secondhand smoking causes heart disease. The lack of awareness, only 5% in Thailand know, um, to 88% in Vietnam. But still, there's never a complete understanding that secondhand smoke is dangerous. It is not as dangerous as uh, smoking a cigarette yourself, of course. It's all to do with the amount of dose and the amount you get. It's most dangerous to smoke, but it's also dangerous to be either married to or to work in an office with a smoker, any prolonged activity. Um, when we talk about smoke-free and smoke-free laws, the most important thing to remember is it's not just the person coming into a bar or a restaurant for maybe half an hour or two hours. It's the people who are working there. If you're wanting smoke-free legislation, it is best to frame it around labor legislation. It's protection of the workers predominantly who benefit from the smoke-free laws. And the tobacco industry will tell you it'll be an economic disaster to restaurants, for example, if they become smoke-free. But in Hong Kong, we actually had looked at the tax returns of all our restaurants combined, every restaurant in Hong Kong, before the ban and then two years two years after the ban, and the tax receipts went up 31%. And everywhere they've done this in the world, they have found that restaurants benefit economically from becoming smoke-free. More families go, um, they stay longer, they enjoy themselves much longer. It is not true, as the tobacco industry says, that restaurants will have to shut down. Not true at all. Now, third-hand smoke, only one or two of you had ever heard of this. Third-hand smoke is contamination by smoke that lingers long after the cigarette, in fact, has been put out. Nicotine and other stuff, they coat surfaces, particularly soft surfaces, like, I guess, this carpet, but in a hotel room with curtains or in a home, in fact. 
um, 11 carcinogens found in third-hand smoke. And they include nitrosamines and radioactive polonium. And these can linger for months, especially in soft furnishings. So we must remember, and when I do the children's section, we'll come back to that, toddlers crawling on carpets are especially vulnerable to picking up that third-hand smoke. Smokeless tobacco, I mentioned earlier, and you can see from this slide that it's the, the area in South Asia is the main place where smokeless tobacco is used. And here we are, that slide again, showing some of the effects of the lip cancer and how dangerous it is. I'll skip over this one. Smokeless use and smoking tobacco. There are many places, such as in um, Asia, where people are using smokeless tobacco as well as smoking tobacco together and how dangerous that is. Health professionals, we've moved a lot from the days where the health professionals used to advertise cigarettes. 2,000 physicians say luckies are less irritating. We've moved a lot from there, but not as much as we should have. Because if you look, this slide is among smoking prevalence among health profession students. That's medical students, dentists, um, pharmacists, and allied health professionals. You can see that in some of these places, the smoking rates are above 40% in some places in Eastern Europe and so on very heavily in America. So we're not actually ourselves as health professionals doing the right thing. These rates should be zero by now, given what we know about um, uh, various tobacco use. And it's especially important because doctors and other healthcare professionals are most effective when they're trying to help their patients quit smoking. So if they're smoking themselves, they're not going to be really able to do very well in terms of trying to get their, um, their um, uh, clients, their clients, their patients, to stop smoking. There are not many places that have got smoke-free health facilities and children's health. I must deal with that before we actually stop. We've still got time, I think, for some questions. The most important thing about children's health is that there are some children who are never born because of tobacco. Because tobacco causes sperm deformity, it causes them to swim and wiggle much less, it causes reduced numbers of sperm, it causes impotence and infertility in men and in women. And in fact, there's quite a number of children in Hong Kong who friends of mine have said, oh, well, you know, we're trying to have a baby, but we haven't been able to. We're going to start infertility treatment. And I said, just do one thing for me first. Just quit smoking for three months. Every single one of them had a baby on those three months once they quit smoking. It's as dramatic as that. And I was in North Korea recently, and uh, the interpreter I had had exactly the same problem. And I said to her, just get your husband to stop smoking, and I bet you'll be able to conceive. So I'm going to go back and find out if that was successful or not. Um, smoking in pregnancy. Children are affected by smoking in pregnancy from the moment of conception. There's many, many different risks, and you'll get these on your slides later. But it also, remember, it's not just affecting the baby, it affects the mother, because there is stillbirth and prematurity, and these have a lot of effect upon the mother and the mother's health and death in childbirth of the mother. If we look at exposure to secondhand smoke of children, the fetus, the infant, the child, it increases stunted development, it causes um, SIDS, exacerbation of asthma, childhood cancers, cleft palate, a risk of allergic diseases, and possible risk of learning disability as the child grows older. And third-hand smoke, as I mentioned, it's this little toddler on this soft carpet. It's this invisible residue that is affecting the third-hand smoke. Now, globally, the av this is a, a small child in China I took a picture of, but globally, the average age of starting to smoke is now under 20, many before the age of 10. And we've just done a global survey, and we haven't found a single country in the world where the average age of starting to smoke is above 20. It's all below 20. So it's really between the ages of about 8 to 20 is the danger years for children. And why do they start? They start because of peer pressure, of curiosity, of rebellion. They want to look grown up. They think it's cool. They're being targeted and manipulated by the tobacco industry. They might think that most adults smoke, even when it's a minority habit. And another important thing to recognize is that the brain development in adolescence starts at the back in your occipital lobes here, and gradually your brain develops until your frontal lobes are fully developed by about 22 to 23. 
And your frontal lobes are where you make long-term decisions. It's, and it has impact not just on smoking, but even in the age of voting, for example, all sorts of things. You don't have that long-term maturity. You don't have that frontal lobe development until you're about 22 to 23. And if you can stop children smoking until that age, they won't start. Nobody starts smoking at my age. So they don't start smoking at your age, in fact, either. It's very much the teenage years that do it. And here are just MRI pictures of exactly what I've said, how it's the frontal lobes take until the early 20s to develop. So if we're looking at which youth smokes and which youth are therefore exposed to most harm, boys more than girls still just about everywhere, they're less intelligent and less educated. If you're going to go on to university, you're much less likely to smoke than if you leave school at 15 and work on a construction site. The youth whose parents smoke, and even if you take one cigarette when you're, say, about eight years old, you try one cigarette, you will, that's an experimenter. The child is much more likely, maybe three years, maybe four years later, to really start smoking more seriously. And the other interesting thing is there's no point talking to eight-year-olds about getting cancer and getting heart disease because they think 20 is old, never mind 60 or maybe 70, to get heart disease or a stroke. The health knowledge, actually, amongst the groups who are going to be smokers and those who are not is the same. They know exactly the same at the health knowledge. The difference between the groups is whether they think it's cool or whether they think it's a dirty and dangerous and expensive habit. And the problem with health education in schools is that it tends to go on and on and on about health, about cancer, about heart disease, about stroke. It's not dealing with this whole image idea of cool or not. It's not dealing with how to say no to your best friend. This is not the man at the school gate in a raincoat. This is a best friend say, come on, you know, what are you so scared of? Let's go and off and have a cigarette. Um, so, um, and tobacco marketing as well has very much targeted. This is a picture from Russia. Again, this is the tobacco industry recruiting young girls and women with very glamorous images. And there's a billboard, in fact, in Indonesia. This is the statement down here. Dying is better than leaving a friend. Sampurna is a cool friend. I mean, in other words, they say it's better to have a cool friend like Saburna, better than dying so to speak. I mean, the most extraordinary images are being thrown at young people. You know, have a cool friend. Saperna is a cool friend. The prevalence in boys around the world is shown in this slide, the prevalence in girls. So girls much less, below 7%. The oranges are below 7%, and you'll see that in most parts of Africa and Asia, we've got the low smoking rates amongst girls. But it's not just that the harm is later on in life. Even when children are children, there are problems of becoming addicted. There's impairment of fitness and sports performance. And there's unattractiveness to the opposite sex. If they've got asthma and respiratory conditions, they get worse. And there's genetic damage already that you can identify that predisposes later when they're adults to getting cancer. There's hardening of the artery walls, even in the teenage years, that predisposes to heart disease later. You can find genetic abnormalities in the sperm of teenage boys who smoke. And of course, there's the economic costs of smoking to a teenager. So the harm of tobacco is not just that they will run into harm later on. It's during the teenage years themselves. And here's the tobacco industry. If our company is to survive and prosper, we must get our share of the youth market. We'll need new brands tailored, especially to the youth market. So the tobacco industry, they certainly know um, just, what, uh, just the market that they're after. So what does it do? It promotes health, attractiveness, popularity, slimness, macho, emancipation, adulthood, all, manipulate, all to manipulate children. And the tobacco industry schools programs that they're running are also there to buy a good corporate image and prevent laws and regulation. They're not effective in reducing youth smoking. So these are some of the images from around the world that you will see that are there to make cigarettes look exciting and trendy and colorful and great and outdoors and cool and all of those sorts of things. And nowadays, one of the things you need to look out for, um, and China actually needs to think about this because they produce quite a lot of films, is the way, five minutes, my goodness. Okay, paid product placement. 
they've had to take their movies off billboards. So what they now do is to place tobacco advertisements in films. They don't call it a tobacco advertisement, but they pay the actresses and the actors and the producers, they pay to get cigarettes put into films just like this. So Sigure Weaver in Avatar, which is set in 2154, she says, where are my cigarettes, guys? What's wrong with this picture? And all, almost all of the smoking you now see coming out of Hollywood is actually paid product advertising. And the problem is the young people don't know that. They think it's a storyline. They think it's part of the film. They don't realize that the advertising has gone from billboards and TV onto the movies in many countries. I think I'm actually going to stop there. I've still got quite a lot to say, but I think it's on uh, the sheets. We got very sidetracked by e-cigarettes, I might say. So I'm really sorry about that. But perhaps just to say um, that we do have a solution and other people will be talking to you about it. We know what to do. We just need the political will to do it. And I suppose maybe this should be my last slide. A kilobyte of prevention is the same as a gigabyte of repair. So I'll open this up to questions now, and I'm sorry that we didn't get to the end, but certainly, is somebody also speaking about e-cigarettes? Could I just ask the organizer? Oh, well, I should have, I, we should have diverted a few questions to later, but it'd be interesting to see what they say to you as well. Yes. Hi, you have mentioned in your slide that uh, youth from so, uh, lowest socioeconomic class are smoke but it is observed that uh, youth from a higher uh, from a burger class also smoke as a fashion and uh, you also mentioned that uh, less educated uh, youth also smoke more yes so uh, but uh, i have also seen yes. professionals who yes. work in international organi uh, organizations even doctors yes even doctors smoke yes uh, you you're quite right to bring that up in <laughs> <laughs> in many countries that, uh, that um, are, um, th there's been less legislation, less knowledge, less taxation. In countries that are just that little bit further behind, it tends to be the, the better educated who first take up the habit, and it's always the better educated who first quit. The middle class educated people 100 years ago were the people who started smoking, and they are the ones who are now beginning to quit. So it depends quite where you are. You find in Western countries, the high income countries, it is a lower social class habit. It's a poor within that country. Um, it's a poor country, but I agree with you. There's many countries where it is smart and trendy to actually the, the, the better educated to smoke, but they will be the first to quit smoking in, in the fullness of time. Hello. Uh, sorry in advance if my question will sound a little bit provocative, but it, uh, it seems to me it cover a very common thing. We know that smokers often excuse their habit, saying, I am smoke only when I, I'm stressed or I'm nervous. Uh, so as a doctor, can you say what is uh, more harmful uh, for health to feel stressed or uh, maybe long-term stress? or uh, smoke one or two cigarettes? Well, smokers will say that they smoke for many different reasons. They smoke to stay awake and to buck up. They smoke to calm themselves down. They smoke to decrease anxiety. Heroin addicts say exactly the same thing. If you're addicted to any substance, you will say you do it because. But the reality is that there is nothing good about smoking at all, nothing good, whatever. Um, and um, as I said, it's, it's interesting that the reasons that smokers give, the reason that addicts give for their addiction is that it makes them feel better at that moment because they're going into withdrawal. And therefore, they're feeding in that withdrawal and getting back up with their nicotine levels. That is not a healthy process. Okay. Ooh. Well, thank you so much. Well, I think this is